Two trains on a collision course threaten hundreds of unsuspecting commuters. In a terrifying instant, the passengers' lives hang in the balance. We want to stop the bleeding, get them out, and get them to the hospital. Joined in a life and death struggle, firefighters race to free victims trapped in the wreckage. We've got now a real disaster, and we don't know how many patients we're going to get. Hospitals prepare to treat the flood of injured and dying victims of this fateful journey. In this program, some of the names have been changed. In California, freight trains move millions of pounds of cargo from southern ports to the entire United States. On April 23, 2002, a train carrying thousands of tons of cargo headed out of Los Angeles. The day was warm and sunny. Glaring sunlight made it difficult to see. The engineer looked for a signal light that would tell him whether it was safe to pass. He thought the track was clear. The train barreled through the light at nearly 50 miles per hour. At this speed, it would take almost three miles to stop. At 7.29 a.m., a commuter train departed Riverside, California. It was on its daily run south, a trip of 53 miles. Like most commuter trains, it shares tracks with larger, heavier freight trains. A complex system of switches and signals keeps them apart. Each morning, this commuter train carries nearly 300 passengers from their homes in Riverside, California, to their jobs in Anaheim and points further south. It was a pleasant way to get to work. A smooth ride, no traffic, and the company of fellow commuters. Charlie Watts rode the train every day. He worked at a branch office of Bluebird Bus Company in Orange, California. Going to work was just wonderful because you did have a, a group that you knew and it was early morning and it was a fresh start of the day, so it became a real social event and a real tight group that you got to know. Part of Charlie's group was Lloyd Dean Keith, who rode the train to Cal State Fullerton where she was dean of students. While some passengers socialized, others used the commute to read and work. William Carter liked to sit on the upper level of the double-decker train. It was quieter, and there were tables to work on. He was preparing to teach a course at his church. For the passengers aboard the train, it was a typical morning commute. But several miles away, a 6,000-ton freight train was heading in their direction. Oblivious to the danger, Matthew Schwager tried to get a jump on the workday. So I pulled out the computer and, and started to uh, do some work, and I was just checking email, just doing some, some replies to the prior day's email. I was riding backwards on the train, backwards to the direction of travel. Ruth Carlson and her friend Liz Benson were seated near Matthew. Ruth was five months pregnant with her first child. April 23rd was Liz's birthday. 
there's a social aspect of it. There's quite a bit of small talk and chatting that goes on. You get to know the people that, that ride around you. Cynthia Runnels also caught the train each morning. It was a nice, wonderful, quiet day. Sat in my same spot I always sit in. Talked to all the same people, which I see every day in the same car. And everything seemed fine. Conductor Peter Paulson counted a total of 240 passengers on board. As the train approached a switching station, engineer Mike Dudgeon slowed to 25 miles per hour. With 10 years of experience under his belt, he expertly controlled the engine and brakes from a small cab at the front of the first car. As the train approached the intersection of Orangethorpe and Ridgefield Road, the crossing gates began to close. Brian Shar, the music director at New River Friends Church, was stuck at the intersection. He passed the time by calling his wife. The two trains barreled into view. To Shar, it looked as if they were on the same track. Inside the cab of the commuter train, engineer Mike Dudgeon spotted the headlights of a freight train. It was heading straight for them. Dudgeon grabbed the emergency brake. For a retired Air Force veteran like Charlie Watts, the sound of the train's brakes signaled trouble. I knew that he went to emergency procedure releasing all the air, so I knew that wasn't normal. The engineer of the freight train saw the approaching commuter train and pulled the brake lever. The brakes on the train grabbed at the wheels as the 6,000-ton train slid forward. Michael Dudgeon knew the freight train couldn't stop in time. It was going to hit them head on. He had to warn the passengers. His face looked like he just saw death, but he didn't tell us exactly what was happening. He just said to get on the ground. He ran through the first car, warning passengers to brace themselves for a collision. Slowly but surely, the commuter train came to a complete stop. The train actually stopped. So I looked up and looked around to see what was happening. And I noticed that we were actually stopped on a road. What caught my attention is off to my left-hand side, there was a, a white pickup truck. And that pickup truck started to back up away from the train. In the first car, seconds ticked by. Nothing happened. Dudgeon thought the freight train had also managed to stop. The engineer and the conductor went up front to check it out. The freight train was still coming. Seconds later, the unthinkable happened. The impact was captured by a nearby security camera. The mile-long freight train slammed into the commuter train with the force of an explosion. The impact was so great, it shoved the lighter commuter train 337 feet down the tracks. Nearly all the passengers were knocked unconscious. Michael Dudgeon had been thrown against a partition. Peter Paulson never made it to the back of the train. He was thrown through the car and slammed his head on the back of a seat. As the passengers lay helplessly, the cars began to fill with smoke. 
Lisa, two trains just collided with one another. Witnesses to the crash frantically called 911. The Orange County Fire Communications Dispatch received the call. Calm down and tell me what's going on there. A train? And what, what did the train hit? I do have help on the way. I need you to give me some more information. How many people are injured? The first report was garbled, according to dispatcher John Dimitro. One of the other dispatchers here in the command center received a 911 call that there had been a, an accident that had occurred of an automobile versus a train. The person was obviously excited, uh, giving us the information very, very quickly. The dispatcher alerted police and rescue personnel. Officer Kelly Kenahan of the Placentia Police Department was one of the first to respond. There was a broadcast over the radio that there had been a train collision. I was automatically thinking that it was possibly either a train versus a bicycle or a train versus a vehicle. John DeMonico, Battalion Chief of the Orange County Fire Authority, was called to the scene. And I received a dispatch message, train versus vehicle. I turned on the red lights and the sirens and started heading to that location. He was only minutes from the crash site. On board the commuter train, the passengers slowly regain consciousness. Hold this to your head. We'll stop the bleeding. Charlie Watts was bruised and bleeding. He couldn't believe his eyes. Everything that could move, moved, including people that were just thrown everywhere. Tremendous amount of head injuries, you know, blood everywhere. Officer Kenahan was unprepared for what he saw. The Metrolink train was absolutely, it was uh, off the tracks that actually buckled and there were still appeared to be a lot of people inside. Witnesses to the crash also rushed forward to help. The doors of the train were jammed. The cars were filling with smoke. The passengers were trapped and panicking. A volunteer grabbed anything he could find to force the doors open. Inside the train, Cynthia Runnels regained consciousness. I didn't understand what happened. I didn't understand right away what happened. Um, I heard people crying, screaming, blood all over. It was a lot of injured people. The doors to the second car were also jammed. In the impact, a woman had fallen against them. It knocked her unconscious and forced her head through the opening. One bystander was familiar with the train's emergency exits. He smashed the release. Brian Shar helped carry the woman to safety. On board the train, Officer Kenahan tended to the injured. Dozens had suffered traumatic head injuries. He called for backup. Chief DeMonico arrived a few minutes later. The crash was like nothing he had ever seen before. Dozens of injured passengers had already struggled from the train. Many more were still inside. I know I have a problem. 
I had people on the car that were probably in much more serious condition than the people I were, was able to see. I had no idea how many people were inside the cars. I know those cars hold uh, over 100 people each. I didn't know if they were capacity. The initial report had erroneously described a train versus vehicle collision. But this was a nightmare. Chief DeMonica would need all the help he could get. I told dispatch that we had a, a train versus train collision, that I had about 40 to 50 people outside of the trains. I was declaring a mass casualty incident. John Dimitru took the call. With additional medic units and ambulances. Additionally, the air ambulances have been placed on standby. Now we're looking at a, a real potential of uh, serious injuries. We've got possible uh, fatalities. Within two minutes, engine company 34 was dispatched to the crash site. Jim Shook is a paramedic trained in mass casualty incidents. We were advised by our dispatch that um, this was actually a train versus train. There's no seat belts in a train car. And it's pretty evident that when you get in an accident that you fly forward or in the direction of where it's impacted. At that point, we discussed that if this was a train that had a lot of victims, that we were going to need to do triaging and set up medical communications. On the upper level of the second car, smoke filled the compartment. The passengers were terrified. They thought fire had broken out on the lower level. They were now trapped on a burning train. On April 23, 2002, outside of Anaheim, California, a passenger train carrying nearly 300 commuters was hit head-on by a freight train. Fire and rescue crews rushed to the scene. As the train cars filled with smoke, passengers struggled to get out. A woman on the top level of the second car pushed out a window. Witnesses to the crash helped any way they could. Matthew Schwager had been working on his computer when the trains collided. Then the, the violent shaking stopped, and the train was filled with smoke. There was a lot of screaming. People were, were screaming and crying, and, and that's, that was the only thing I heard. People's panic. And the panic in the train was just absolutely intense. You could, you could feel it. I stood up. I guess I realized I could stand up. I didn't even think about it. I, I stood up. Um, I didn't feel anything. I f saw the cuts. I saw that I was hurt and perceived that I'd been hurt, but I didn't feel anything. And just went immediately to this woman that was on the floor. She looked like she was in incredible pain. I thought maybe her legs are broken. I asked her, can, can you feel your feet? And touched her feet to see if she could feel herself. I just went into a kind of a response mode to try to, to help people that seemed to be in worse condition than I was. Brian Shar ventured inside the train. He was worried. He had seen liquid draining from the cars. The interior smelled like something was burning. Your first thought is, there's gonna be an explosion or a fire or something. We need to get everybody away get everybody out. Ignoring the danger, he helped people one by one. 
A businessman had a badly injured leg. Char helped pull him from beneath a seat. Ruth Carlson was five months pregnant. She thought her water had broken, and she was too badly injured to move. Char stayed by her side. It really struck a chord with me that I just immediately started praying that, oh God, I, I pray that she's okay and that her baby's okay. Uh, my wife is in her mid-30s, and this gal was in her mid-30s, and we just had a baby about six months before, and so I was really concerned for her. Some, uh, some... In the third car, dazed passengers tried to understand what had happened to them. In post-9-11 America, many thought the train had been attacked by terrorists. They struggled to get off. Charlie Watts stayed inside to care for a woman with a bleeding head injury. She told him her name was Patricia. He watched helplessly as blood pooled on the floor beneath her. She thought she was going to die, and then so did I, but I didn't want to tell her that. I thought there was internal injuries, and she was just so bleeding. And I said, you know, she could bleed to death before somebody gets to her. Within minutes of getting the call, the fire and rescue squad from Orange County arrived on scene. Chief DeMonico dispatched paramedics with rescue equipment. It was their job to triage the victims and stabilize the injured. It's very important to work quickly, especially in, in a situation where we could have trauma injuries and people could be bleeding. We want to get them out. We want to stop the bleeding, get them out, and get them to the hospital. Orange County firefighters were the first rescuers to board the train. They took over for Officer Kennahan, securing the victim in a neck brace. Like most of the passengers, she had been knocked unconscious in the crash. They were concerned she had also sustained neck and spinal cord injuries. Paramedic Jim Shook was stunned by the devastation. As we get up to the train car, I stepped in and I kind of surveyed the area. There were people that were injured laying down. There was a lot of blood and other body fluids that were on the floor as well as the seating. I announced to the passengers that were within the car that anybody who could stand up and hear my name, they needed to exit the car. What that does for us is it separates what we call the walking wounded from the patients that are more severely injured. Paramedic Jim Shook triaged victims. He needed to assess their injuries quickly and move them to safety. Firefighters working outside the train had not yet sounded the all clear. If a container carrying hazardous or flammable substances had ruptured in the crash, they could all be killed. Shook examined a woman who had been thrown from her seat when the trains collided. Although she was in extreme pain, she did not display external injuries. Many of the cases were like this, and it made triage difficult. You approach a patient and you ask him simple things, like, what's your name? Can you tell me where you are? Can you squeeze my hands? That type of thing. And if they follow those simple commands, you move on to the next. The victim was disoriented. Shook slipped a triage tag around her wrist, labeling her case immediate. I need a backboard on this lady. She's an immediate, OK? Shook moved on to Patricia. She was bleeding from a severe head wound. The paramedic was more concerned with what he couldn't see, internal injuries and bleeding. With so many victims, Shook only had a few seconds to assess each one but his training had prepared him to deal with mass casualties. Are you having trouble breathing at all? Okay. You assess their respirations. Are they breathing? 
If they're breathing, then you assess how quickly they're breathing. If it's over 30, you tag them as immediate. If they're not breathing, you readjust their head position to try to um, open their airway, because the tongue usually blocks their airway. If they have spontaneous respirations with the movement of, of uh, their head, then they're tagged as immediate at that point. Patricia was in excruciating pain. She had suffered a head injury. Jim Shook tagged her immediate and moved on. Charlie Watts stayed with her until she could be moved to an ambulance. There were hundreds of wounded passengers, some with life-threatening injuries. Chief DeMonico needed more help. I ordered additional equipment in addition to what I had upgraded to the first time and asked for more engines and more ambulances. The Orange County dispatcher called in every fire company in a several mile radius. So at this point now, we really went into full-blown emergency mode, really built up quickly a, a response. We don't have the uh, ability to know what that train's going to do, so we want to just make sure we keep all the resources as much as possible going to these people to get them out, get them home, get them safe. At the Fullerton Fire Station, Captain Mike Phil got the call. He said this was a train versus a Metrolink. It looked like uh, there was major damage and a large number of injuries, possibly serious. He was declaring it an MCI, mass casualty, and he wanted the nearest five medic engines right away and several ambulances right away. Firefighters worked quickly to move the injured outside where they could be treated. In the first car, a young woman was suffering from lacerations and a neck injury. Paramedics stabilized her neck in a brace and carefully placed her on a backboard. She was tagged immediate. When Captain Mike Phil arrived, he was overwhelmed by the scope of the suffering. It was real surreal, real quiet, and they were walking up to us, almost bouncing off of us, and they were, you know, holding their face, and uh, they had blood coming down, you know, from cut, you know, lacerations on their forehead, their cheekbones, their jaws, you know, bloody noses, and all over their, you know, blouses, their suits, and, you know, shirts and ties, and looking for help, wanting help. These were people that were in a state of fright, panic. Uh, you could see it in their eyes, you could see it in their face, you could see the emotions, you could see the tears. Captain Phil and his team set up a triage area on a 50-foot stretch of dirt between the tracks and the road. It would also have to serve as a makeshift treatment area for the growing number of injured until they could be transported to the hospital. DeMonico had called in every resource he could think of. And still, it was not enough. I had approximately 300 passengers on a train. I knew I needed some more ambulances. And I was very, very concerned that we had people that were trapped in there. Without more resources to transport critically injured passengers, some of the victims would die. On April 23, 2002, the unthinkable happened. A freight train had collided with a packed commuter train in Orange County, California. With hundreds of injured on board, rescue personnel from all over the county responded to the scene. Orange County Fire Chief John DeMonico coordinated a massive rescue effort. And still, it was not enough. He was about to receive help from an unexpected source. Embraer, just five miles away. 
hundreds of firefighters from around the region were participating in a mass casualty exercise. Red Cross coordinator Lisa Laris received the call that the drill had been canceled. We realized it was a real scenario. Um, so all resources were deployed to the incident. There were approximately 18 ambulances that were at the exercise already, as well as approximately 20 fire engines. The drill coordinator was informed of a possible multi-casualty incident, or MCI. Less than 12 minutes after the crash, additional paramedics and firefighters were dispatched to the scene. More help was on the way. Now, Chief DeMonico's most pressing concern was making sure both train engines were secure and would not explode. I had a freight train that was a mile and a quarter long with unknown cargo. Was there any hazardous materials on there or not? And, and until you know what it is, that's the biggest fear, is just not knowing. DeMonico's men would have to check thousands of tons of containers, searching for signs of hazardous material. The chief dispatched teams to deal with any fire suppression and check the engines for evidence of dangerous leaks or spills. There's 40,000 volts that run through the locomotives. The freight train had three locomotives. They checked all the hoses and connections on the freight train, looking for anything that might ignite. Had a locomotive on the Metrolink train. Uh, they have a lot of diesel fuel. We don't know if we have any fire problems until we, we inspect those and make sure we don't have any fuel leaks. Electricity and diesel fuel are a deadly combination. They checked the Metrolink train for fuel leaks and electrical shorts. 40,000 volts of electricity pulsing through the wrecked train would kill the passengers and the firefighters in an instant. There were many damaged train cars. Any one of them could contain a threat. About 100 yards from the crash site, firefighters found one of the crew members of the freight train. His legs had broken when he jumped from the train. From inside the train, firefighters reported many more victims. I'm in uh, car number two, triage. We have 85 patients in here. 40 looks like they're immediate. Uh, we'll have about uh, 35 delayed, and then the rest look like they're walking wounded. There was no sign of fire, but the number of injured had climbed to over 100. So we're going to get uh, four engines from uh, in order up additional ambulances. They called for additional ambulances. Companies from all over the county sent every ambulance in their fleet. Over a hundred fully equipped rescue vehicles. Jim Shook made his way to the upper level of the first car. There he found William Carter lying under one of the seats. Carter was pale and his respiration dangerously shallow. I encountered a gentleman that was laying on the floor and underneath the benches. His head was tilted in a way that would make it difficult to breathe. In the impact, Carter's body had slammed into the edge of a work table. The paramedic was afraid he had sustained life-threatening internal injuries. He cleared the victim's airway and inserted a tube to help him breathe. Hey, Cliff, I got an immediate right here. He wasn't breathing. Why don't you get him out to the treatment area? Shook tagged the patient. They needed to get him to the hospital fast. One hour earlier, William Carter had been preparing for a Bible class during his morning commute. Now, he was fighting for his life. His respiration was poor and his pulse was fading. Paramedics struggled to stabilize him so they could move him to the treatment area. Outside the train, Captain Mike Phil got word that Carter was on his way out. 
I could hear radio traffic saying that uh, they were bringing off a gentleman that uh, appeared to be in a full rest, and he was coming to our treatment area, so I knew we, we were going to have our hands full shortly. Jaime Pinedo had only been with the department a few weeks. It was the first time he had encountered a case this severe. He looked like he was in full arrest. He had no color, he was pale. I started doing compressions. The paramedics put him on a heart monitor. Pinedo continued compressions. The patient did not respond. They tried to start an IV, but they could not find a vein. His veins had collapsed. I remember looking down at his face, and it's just a feeling of helplessness, because the person looked like he was dead. We're trying to revive him. The cardiac monitor showed a rhythm, but not a pulse. William Carter was declared dead at the scene. The train collision had claimed its first victim. April 23, 2002. It was the worst train wreck in Southern California history. freight train had collided with a commuter train, leaving hundreds of injured passengers. Witnesses to the crash were horrified. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Many rushed forward to help. Inside the train, Cynthia Runnels had been slammed into the seat in front of her. Her head was cut badly, and she was bleeding heavily. I was scared, very scared. A man who had witnessed the crash rushed to help her. I remember looking up, this guy in the black tank top was taking his shirt off and then he put it, he tied it around my head, my head wound, um, held my hands, told me I'm gonna be fine. He said he was gonna stay right there with me, which he did. The stranger staunched her bleeding until paramedics arrived. The paramedics said he did a really good job and I think he may have saved my life. I don't know his name. I don't know exactly where he lived. I don't know anything about him. And I hope we meet up sometime so I could thank him. Now rescue officials faced a new problem. They had over 100 passengers to move, and some of them were critically injured. Getting them to area hospitals was a monumental job. Bill Weston stepped in to coordinate ambulance traffic. We got a lot of vehicles, police cars, fire trucks, ambulances on scene in a very short amount of time. So we had a large number of vehicles, up to 50 ambulances, arriving simultaneously, which created a traffic nightmare. Weston realized that there was a very small area allocated to dozens of ambulances. If someone didn't direct them, they would get snarled in traffic and delay getting patients to the hospital. What I had to do was uh, step out of the vehicle and use our other supervisors and literally uh, direct ambulances by hand, uh, giving them hand signals and voice commands to uh, back up, untangle themselves. Once the ambulances were cleared, they now had access to the patients. Immediate cases went first. They were the most critical. Delayed cases followed at a rate of one every minute. Inside car two, Matthew Schwager watched over Liz Benson. She was thrown into that door feet first, and her, her legs were crumpled uh, against that door. Um, there were there was a lot of blood. And I speed dialed her husband and, and told him who I was. I'm a train rider. I ride with your wife on the train. There's been a wreck. And your wife is okay. I'm going to put her on the phone. Yeah. 
I saw one of the paramedics coming on board. He had a, a gurney of, of some sort, a backboard, I think it was. And we positioned her, put her onto the backboard, and, and carried her out to the, the door of the train, and that more paramedics were there already, so they took her from that point. On the lower level of car two, Brian Shar, a witness to the crash, comforted Ruth Carlson. The young woman was five months pregnant. She was terrified she would lose her baby. When paramedics arrived, they checked her vital signs and examined her for injuries. She was shaken up and distraught, but her condition was not dangerous. With the help of paramedics, she was able to walk from the train. Anaheim Memorial received word to prepare for a mass influx of trauma casualties. Tim Korber was the director of emergency services. The operator called a code disaster external. This indicates that there is a disaster external to the hospital and that they are preparing to send us patients. Less than two miles from the hospital, an injured businessman went into cardiac arrest. Although they were only minutes from the ER, paramedics were afraid he had run out of time. A devastating train collision near Anaheim, California, left 100 people injured and stretched emergency services to the limit. At a makeshift treatment area, Ruth Carlson was placed on a backboard for transport. She was five months pregnant, and paramedics watched for signs of early labor. Ruth was one of many victims en route to the area hospitals. Paramedics had already mapped out the route and coordinated the flow of patients. Lloydine Keith, the dean of students at Cal State Fullerton, was rushed to a hospital in Anaheim. She was in pain and her breathing was labored. Paramedics started an IV line and put her on oxygen. St. Jude Medical Center braced for the onslaught. Their first patient was John Sampson, an older businessman. He had suffered massive internal injuries. By the time he arrived in the ER, he was in full cardiac arrest. Doctors worked quickly to try and revive him. He was given a shot to stimulate his heart and intubated to help him breathe. Charged. Clear. Okay, hold back. Okay. Nothing seemed to help. They were losing the patient. After 30 minutes, John Sampson was pronounced dead. The crash had claimed yet another life. Dr. Tim Korber is the head of emergency medicine at Anaheim Memorial Hospital. We might get 50, 100, 150 patients in in a very short period of time. The main challenge was making sure that the sicker patients, the more critically injured patients, were being moved to the front of the line. Doctors were seeing a lot of head injuries. Even a minor head trauma can turn fatal without warning. Each patient was given x-rays and CAT scans. The large cut on Cynthia Runnell's head concerned doctors. When questioned, she could remember everything up until the crash, but nothing after that. 
The nurses and the doctors asked if I remember what happened, if I can recall anything that led up to what happened, and which I did to the very minute, but I, after that, after we actually got hit, I didn't understand what happened. Doctors looked for any sign of permanent damage. They determined that Cynthia had sustained a severe concussion, but would recover. At Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Jan Shimke had a full day of surgery scheduled. But when she learned about the train crash, she rushed straight to the ER to help. Conductor Peter Paulson was still disoriented. You want to try to find the things that are going to cause the patient to immediately expire. We always first are concerned that they're uh, breathing and uh, that they have a blood pressure. And after that, then we have a systematic approach of uh, checking patients from the head down to their feet. Shimke carefully assessed his injuries. The patient seemed confused. The skill is being able to diagnose it very quickly, because if you don't, then the patient will die uh, very rapidly. In order to diagnose it, uh, it takes some clinical judgment. It's also based upon the mechanism of injury, meaning how the patient was injured. It's generally a blunt trauma. Shimke wasn't taking any chances. She ordered a head CT to look for any signs of trauma. We had to take many x-rays, um, looking for broken bones and other uh, collapsed lungs and other uh, neck injuries, uh, potential uh, you know, injuries that could cause paralysis. The issue with the blunt trauma is it's not like a gunshot wound. Uh, the bullet goes in, the bullet does some damage. The main decision is do you need to operate or not? Blunt trauma, there can be a lot of hidden injuries that can ultimately kill a patient. Testing confirmed what paramedics had suspected. Peter Paulson had a severe concussion, but he would survive. Ruth Carlson had been dispatched to another local hospital. She was five months pregnant. On the train, paramedics feared her water had broken. She had been seen by an OBGYN who tested her for any signs of stress on her unborn child. Both she and her baby were going to be fine. Lloydine Keith arrived at a hospital in Anaheim. Her condition had stabilized in the ambulance. She too would survive. Family members flooded the hospitals looking for their loved ones. Patients with minor injuries were released. Five weeks later, Lloydine Keith was back riding the train. As soon as I was able to take the train, I started taking the train. I felt I needed to do that. I needed to, as they say, you know, kind of get back on the horse that threw you. So I continued to ride there just to stare in the face. In an investigation conducted by the National Transportation Safety Board, it was found that the 6,000-ton freight train impacted the passenger train at 22 miles per hour. Two men died in the hours following the catastrophe. A third passenger, an elderly woman, died nearly two months later. Well over 100 people were injured. If the train had been traveling just five miles an hour faster, all of the passengers would have been killed on impact. <laughs>